I'm here because I believe in social justice, and I think this is a wonderful and powerful way to push the agenda. I'm here because I care. I'm here because I've never spoken to a police officer before in my life. <laughs> I'm here because I like Benjamins, but I'm here to make a change. <laughs> I'm here because I wanted to get out my show. This is not me, and I wanted to help out. The civilians understand that we're not scared, especially big cops. Are not Why are you here? Why am I here? Why are you here? Why am I here? I'm here because I wanted to share my experience and share my story and influence other people. When I think of protect, serve, and understand, I think of police officers because that's what they should do, at least to protect and serve. This project came about because I got really angry at seeing videotape after videotape on the news of police violence. The understanding, I think that's a unison. That's the thing that should happen between the people, the civilians, and the officers. I was watching the Eric Gardner video over and over and over again and getting really PO'd, you know, what can I say? That I felt that they were not seeing what was going on. They were not really looking at what that man was doing. He was not really paying attention to what they were doing and it escalated beyond control and it became tragic. Nobody's listening to nobody. That's all it is. Nobody's listening to the other person and that's the problem. If me and you having a conversation, you want to have my attention, you expect me to be able to repeat some of the things that you said. I know as an actor that my stock and trade is being in the present. It's learning how to really talk to people and really listen to people because that's what good theater is about. That's why people pay big bucks to go to Broadway to see really good acting and people living in the moment. It's very hard to do. I became aware of this program uh, with Irondale due through uh, my department. Uh, they actually sent out a notification to each precinct in Brooklyn North and they stated they wanted um, volunteers who can come uh, interview for some kind of acting gig and I jumped at it. So I wrote to the police commissioner, wrote a snail mail letter and I said, I'm sorry, you really need what we do and here's what we do and we can help you. And I, I sent it off. Two days later, I got a call from one police plaza from Deputy Commissioner Herman's office saying, when can you come in and talk about a pilot project? I didn't really understand it at the time, but then when I came in for the interview process and I met with uh, the civilians and the other cops, I understood that it was bridging some kind of gap, trying to come to an understanding. And I knew, though, what we would do, because we've been doing this for 35 years at, as a theater company. We've worked with so many different kinds of populations to build bridges or to help teach through the art and craft of theater. This is how we start. Every week for 10 weeks, we have dinner together. And then we improvise. And at dinner, usually after 15 or 20 minutes or so, we pose to the group some sort of essential question just to get some conversation going. They just throw out there and say, an unarmed black man was shot. That's it. We have to elaborate more on that, and we were going to try to break it down and maybe get to see two sides of the story, get to see the officer's uh, view, and then obviously get the civilian's view and find out what went wrong, what happened. What about the knee? What about the ankle? What if, I mean, why is it always to shoot, to kill? That's well, what I don't get. I, well, it's not really shoot to kill. I mean, it's, we're taught, we're not taught to shoot to kill. We're taught that we have to use deadly physical force to stop, to stop the threat. And the shooting of the hand and the knee, that's all SBU, TV, movie magic stuff, that one bullet puts someone down. There's been times and there's been stories where an officer has shot once and the person walked with a bullet and kept approaching that officer like it was nothing. 
So you need seven. You need five shots to take a person down. I, I don't know. And we're not talking about the unarmed, like, a, so again, there's like a level, right? If there is someone who is armed, I don't like the term civilian because I feel like we're all civilians at this table, but it's like if someone is coming at you with the weapon, I understand your position. That's not what we're arguing here. What we're arguing is that the story keeps repeating somebody unarmed, shot by police, comma, again. But the thing well, about the story that they thought he was armed. It, they, they didn't know right. that he was. What's but again, the five, five, five the bullets, though? Five bullets, that, that, that's the clincher? That's, that's where we're well, at? No, they, they found out after the fact that he was on the... And I heard, and I opened the door and I said, officers, can I just explain to you what's going on? The areas that people usually get shot by police officers are not in areas where I work at. Busy commands is different because, you know, we're used to seeing it. Slow commands is different for police officers because they're not really used to seeing it. So when somebody says they have a gun, they take that ultra search, like, oh my God, it's a gun. Oh. Like where I work, you, you might get 200 calls a day about somebody has a gun, you know, and half of those, maybe 25% might be legit stories that somebody does have a firearm. So when we go to those jobs, we know how to handle a little different because you automatically know this person might not have a gun. They might be selling drugs and grandma's calling or the neighbors are calling because this is what happens. I've sat down with officers that are like, oh my God, I don't think I can do this. And I'm like, listen, man, if this ain't the job for you, you need to quit. If you're afraid, you need to go because don't hurt nobody. Because you might go out there thinking a kid has a gun and he doesn't. He has a weapon and he doesn't. And then I say, you ruin that family's life, and then your life is ruined forever. So if you're not, if you can't work in a busy area where you know you're gonna have to, a lot more responsibility than a slow precinct, you gotta wanna do it. I've been shot at several times. I don't go home and be like, honey, I hate all these people. Oh, they shot at me. I realize where I work at, I know I have to be safe, but I realize the people are dependent upon me and my coworkers to keep them safe from the people in the neighborhood who they fear. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? We go to our homes, we go to our dinner tables, we go to our friends, the people that we really call friends, and we have these conversations that are uncomfortable and have them and have open, honest conversations and speak our minds and be real and honest with each other. Doing something like this where you have to really dig down for what you're feeling and sometimes being able to stomach that other people don't really feel the same way you do. And then to come to some type of meeting ground so that, that you can coexist with each other. You know, so I, I would just like to say that this is, this is a challenge. It's not that easy, but the challenge is definitely worth it if you can change some views and save some lives. I really do feel this is a way to begin the conversation. It's not a way to solve the problems. But if you can begin enough conversations, then those people who converse together can figure out ways to solve problems down the line. What do you carry in your hat? Paper towel, because sometimes I sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Religious artifacts. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on?